Um, well, it's a great honor to be here. Again, I'm Neil Tsutsui. I'm in the Department of Environmental Science Policy and Management at UC Berkeley. And I've been studying um, invasive ants for a long time, especially this species that you see here, the Argentine ant. And I'm going to talk about it a bit today. Um, but I guess to sort of honor our predecessors, I thought um, I would take a different tack than I normally take in talks. And instead of you know just launching into my research and why we do it, um, I thought it would be interesting to do sort of a little intellectual exercise, and perhaps profitable for us as well, to look at um, the research that I normally do and that um, people who study ant invasions normally do through the lens of a chapter that was in the original Baker and Stebbins. Um, and the chapter I'm thinking of, of course, as a myrmecologist, is uh, the first chapter that was written by Ed Wilson titled The Challenge from Related Species. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about, um, so he spends a lot of time in this first chapter talking about the taxon cycle. Um, especially um, as he has developed it um, from uh, observations that he's made about um, the distribution of ants and ant ecosystems in Melanesia. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit um, and where that sort of has, um, how the idea has progressed through history. And then I'm going to talk um, a bit about um, some of the research that we've been doing in my lab that, that um, is relevant for um, this concept of the taxon cycle. And so I'm sure uh, many of you are probably familiar with the taxon cycle. Um, it's something that was developed by Ed Wilson in sort of, you know, classic Wilsonian, um, uh, following a classic Wilsonian method. And that is, is there a pointer on here? There we go. Um, that is that Ed Wilson, you know, traveled throughout the South Pacific, throughout Melanesia and Polynesia, um, Southeast Asia, collecting ants, right? He's, you know, pr first and foremost a naturalist. And in collecting these ants, he... Um, was able to as assemble species distributions for a variety of different species. And looking at closely at them, he was also interested in sort of reconstructing the evolutionary history of um, these ant species, these ant genera, um, diff at different taxonomic levels. And overall, the general pattern that he saw was that ants tend to um, colonize, this is looking at um, the subfamily Ponerinae, um, tend to colonize um, the uh, islands of Melanesia, you know, following these arrows here. So this is just a general schematic that uh, sort of qualitatively represents the patterns that he saw in um, species distributions and communities. Moreover, when he looked more closely at where these species occurred, he, um, a pattern emerged. Um, so here on the x-axis, we have different types of habitats that occur throughout Melanesia. And these are pretty much ordered from most disturbed, sort of what he called marginal habitats, to um, more pristine and more stable habitats. Um, these, are ten these habitats, as you go from left to right, also tend to increase in elevation and tend to increase in distance away from the coast, right? So these are the most interior high elevation sites. These are the most coastal low elevation sites. And just to sort of visualize it here, he broke the um, ponerine species that he saw into three general categories. And those categories are shown here. He called them stage one, stage two, and stage three. These are basically species that um, clearly have recently expanded into Melanesia, typically from Southeast Asia. Um, stage two species are species that um, speciated in Melanesia, but the center of diversity of this group is somewhere else. So these are species that historically appeared to have colonized Melanesia. They're not currently expanding there, but at some point in the past they did, and they formed good species there. And then the third group, these stage three, are ones that recently speciated from a species group that's center of diversity does occur in Melanesia. So these are Melanesian endemics, right? And so, um, and what he found is when he looked at these three different types of species classifications across these three, or these six different habitat types, there is, um, they were clearly non-randomly distributed. You see that the expanding species tend to occur coastally in the most disturbed uh, low elevation sites. And as you move to high elevations to more pristine sites, you have increasing um, species richness within the communities. You have increasing occurrence of endemic species. Um, and de at, conversely, you have decreasing abundance of these expanding species. And so this pattern, whoops, where are we going here? So this pattern um, led Wilson to develop just a couple of years prior to the publication of Baker and Stebbins, this idea of what he called the taxon cycle. Um, and this, um, is a um, sort of a deterministic model to explain um, how ant species communities um, are assembled in the islands, um, but it applies to a variety of different habitats as well. Um, in the years since this, this model has um, been largely supplanted by 
A subsequent model, Ed Wilson and MacArthur developed, of course, the equilibrium theory of island biogeography, but I think that there are still some, um, some sort of worthwhile gems in this sort of more deterministic perspective of um, how uh, species can uh, colonize new habitats and what happens to them after they do that. So this is how the taxon cycle works. Um, for ants um, and other taxa, presumably, in Southeast Asia, you have um, uh, an ecosystem that has a variety of different species that co-occur there. It um, uh, uh, serves as the source for um, colonists moving out into the world. Um, you have some species within this habitat that evolve or adapt to um, mar what he calls marginal habitats. These are things that are typically disturbed habitats, ephemeral habitats, things like riparian areas, coastal areas, more recently human disturbed habitats. Um, so these species um, acquire adaptations, <sighs> acquire adaptations to these marginal habitats, and then they're introduced under Wilson's model under natural mechanisms, but for invasive species nowadays, this is typically human-mediated introductions, um, but by whatever method, they're introduced to similar types of habitats in new parts of their range, shown here, and then a couple different things can happen. They can um, become established, but then eventually go extinct, shown by this line here, or if they become established and continue to spread, they'll often now start to spread into more pristine habitats, more high elevation habitats. They become um, adapted to these uh, new habitats, and then they can go on to um, speciate within their new range. And then perhaps uh, one or more species may then uh, re-evolve uh, modifications or adaptations to this marginal habitat and go on to colonize other places. And so the taxon cycle continues. Um, and, many, and so um, what you see is, you can visualize this occurring you know, over evolutionary time spans as sort of a series of concentric circles, right? If you're looking at an island, you have colonists arriving on the shoreline, and through evolutionary time spans, marching you know, away from the shoreline, moving up in elevation, and then you have new colonists arriving again on the shoreline. And so at any sort of fixed point in time, if you look at the distribution of species across um, the geography of an individual island, you see the most uh, ancient lineages and the most endemic species occurring in the center at the high elevation, and then that decreases as you go to lower elevations and um, the periphery. Um, so this idea of the taxon cycle was recently revisited by, revisited by Evan Economo and Eli Sarnet um, in this paper that was published in uh, AMNAT in 2012. And, um, there are lots of things that, of course, have changed in the past 50 years since Ed Wilson originally was looking at the ants of Melanesia. And, um, and so in this case, uh, uh, Economo and Sarnat looked at uh, well over 10,000 individual specimens of ants. This is a huge data set, that ants that were collected through a variety of different methods. Um, they focused primarily on Fiji, looking at 177 ant species that occur in Fiji. And just by comparison, the number of ant species um, that were described for Fiji um, in Ed Wilson's when, um, original um, examination, it was 58. So this has increased about threefold since, more than threefold, since Ed Wilson's original work. And so um, these guys take a generally similar approach. They divide their ant species um, into four general categories. You have exotics. These are things that have a native range somewhere well outside of Melanesia. They've been introduced. These are our tramp ants, or pest ants, or invasive ants, whichever term you choose to use. Widespread natives, so these are things that um, uh, have uh, evolved elsewhere and spread into Melanesia. We have endemic ala species, so these are species that, similar to as Wilson formulated it, evolved within Melanesia and speciated there. And then deep endemics, these are things that seem to be um, re historical relics from um, previously more widespread, more species-rich groups. Um, these four panels show on the y-axis just elevation where these individual specimens were collected. On the x-axis, we have the different habitat types moving from most disturbed here. Um, we have port cities and human-dominated landscapes on the left-hand side over to primary rainforest on the right-hand side. And then the size of the circles just indicates the probability of finding a particular species in a particular location, right? And so if you look at exotics, clearly exotics are found, you know, in these port cities and human-modified habitats, primarily. And then as you move through these sort of um, more ancient lineages, you see widespread natives are found at higher elevations and less disturbed habitats, endemic ala species, even more so, and then the deep endemics you're typically only finding them in the disturbed forest or primary rainforest, largely at high elevations. And so this distribution is consistent with, with what Wilson originally saw. 
um, and um, is consistent with the predictions you would expect under the taxon cycle. But there are lots of different things that can lead to these species distributions, right? Maybe you just have invasive species that are coming in and clobbering these coastal habitats again and again and again. And so whenever you happen to look at them, you have invasive species, whichever one it may be, in the port cities or human-modified habitats. The real key to determining whether or not this is actually occurring as this sort of directional cycle is being able to answer the question, you know, are species that once they colonize an island, are they shifting in phenotype and shifting in distribution you know, more inland, right? Instead of having the static situation where there's just churn in each of the different habitats, especially on the coast, you know, is there this dynamic where things are marching to the center and higher elevations over evolutionary timescales? And so to address this, um, Economo and Sarnet focused in on a hyperdiverse um, species, or hyperdiverse genus, um, the Fidoli, um, in, uh, in Fiji. And so um, here are the species that occur in Fiji, the species of Fidoli. Um, and uh, on the uh, left-hand side here, you can see that they've divided them into the same categories as before. We have exotics, widespread natives, and then two groups of endemics. Um, we have a pretty well-resolved phylogeny for uh, Fodoli, and so um, based on that uh, phylogenetic reconstruction, we can, um, it appears likely that um, uh, some ancestor, ancestral Fodoli uh, colonized Fiji back here and then radiated into these species in situ in Fiji. And there are two uh, main species groups of these endemic fodoli. Um, here we have a uh, representation of uh, disturbance. Here we have a representation of elevation, where these individual species were collected. And you can see this just um, shows the same pattern that I've showed you on the previous slide, that the widespread invader occurs in port cities, wide, widespread um, natives occur in less disturbed habitat, and then these endemics that speciated in situ in Fiji occur in the primary rainforest at high elevations. However, since there is a well-resolved phylogeny for Fodoli, um, Economo and Sarnat were able to um, perform an ancestral state reconstruction looking specifically at what do, what do they think, or what appears to be the ancestral state of uh, elevation and habitat type used by presumably an ancestor back here prior to the speciation of this group. And so that ancestral state reconstruction is shown here. Um, here we have disturbance gradient, here we have elevation, same as before. Um, each of these dots indicates one of the species shown here. So here we have the invasive Fidoli megacephala, here we have the widespread natives. And then here we have these two species groups that are endemic to Fiji. This box here, I don't know if you guys can see it, this re represents the 95% confidence interval for the ancestral state reconstruction for disturbance on this axis and elevation on this axis. And can you see that one of these species group, the Nolazai species group, doesn't appear to have changed much from the inferred ancestral state, but clearly this group has. These species, with the one exception of this one um, species here, have all moved outside of this 95% confidence interval, suggesting that not only um, you know, are, have they uh, you know, colonized historically and speciated in Fiji, but they've also undergone this shift in both um, habitat type and elevation since their uh, colonization of Fiji by their ancestor. And so this is, uh, uh, this, this pattern, shown by uh, this group anyway, is entirely consistent with what we would expect to see under the taxon cycle. What's going on with this group? We don't know. It's possible, I mean, so, you know, there's no expectation that all species will follow, that, you know, will pro progress through the cycle at the same rate in a clock-like fashion. It may be that these, um, will do so at some point in the future, or it may be that um, there are other forces that are dictating um, the evolutionary trajectory of the species group. Okay, and so this is, um, the taxon cycle was initially generated to explain um, sort of large scale uh, evolutionary patterns and ecological patterns, the species level, genus level, even at the subfamily level in ants. What does this have to do with um, invasive species or colonists that occur over sort of more recent time scales that we're interested in? Um, well, um, most of you have probably noticed already that there are some clear parallels to um, what we typically see in the introduction of newly invasive species um, over much shorter time scales. And so here we have the same diagram from Wilson before, but we can, when we think about invasive species now, we think about, you know, they can often undergo pre-adaptations in their native range that allow them to colonize a habitat. Um, the introduction here is... Um, something that uh, the, the barrier to introduction that historically has occurred for natural species dispersing under their own power has um, largely been eliminated for many of the trampy species that we see in the world due to human-mediated transport. Um, this is true for, um, 
it's a truism essentially for invasive species. In many cases, there are species that fail to establish, um, and there are some good data that have been collected on this for ants by Andy Suarez and colleagues. And then um, uh, this is really where the bulk of research on invasive, invasive species, um, in ants anyway, has occurred. We study them primarily in their introduced range. We study their impacts on um, uh, habitats that they've invaded, on the organisms that uh, are experiencing um, the pressures of these new invasive species, and we do a little bit of work looking at um, where these, how these invasive species are changing through time post-introduction. Um, what I'm going to talk about today, though, is um, this uh, stage of uh, invasion, pre-adaptation, which is something that I think um, uh, is a fruitful area to study, and I think in um, social insect biology anyway, and entomology generally, is uh, often neglected. It's much less well studied than sort of post-introduction biology. Um, much of my career has actually been spent looking at this type of stuff, and so I'll touch on some of the things that um, we studied in Argentine ant biology um, in terms of their um, uh, colony structure and biology in their introduced range at the end of the talk. All right, so the Argentine ant um, is the species that uh, is sort of the bread and butter in my lab. Uh, it's a species that occurs, as the name suggests, uh, its native range is here in northern Argentina, southern Brazil, Uruguay, and Paraguay. And it's been introduced to pretty much every Mediterranean-type climate in the world, shown by these red circles. So it occurs in the true Mediterranean, southern Australia, New Zealand. Um, within the past decade, it's been introduced to Japan, um, many Atlantic and Pacific islands, South Africa. It was first introduced to North America in New Orleans um, in the late 1800s, in the 1890s. And then um, pretty soon, within, about, within a few years, um, uh, was introduced to California and spread throughout California. And here, it's in California, it is by far the most common arthropod um, that you'll find. So yesterday, I was walking by the chapel here, and there are Argentine ants walking around on the curb. If you want to see what they look like in real life, they're out there. Um, they're, um, if you go to pretty much any uh, urban or coastal habitat in California, um, south of, you know, south of Ukiah, I don't know if you know where Ukiah is, but pretty much anywhere except for the farther, farthest northern reaches of California along the coast or urban areas, if you look down at the ground, within 30 seconds or a minute, you'll find an Argentine ant. They are incredibly common, incredibly abundant, and as you'd expect for something so common and abundant, they, ha they um, have a devastating uh, impact on native species that, uh, that, uh, that uh, coexist or formerly coexisted with them. Um, so, and that, that sort of, um, those sorts of impacts are very well documented for Argentine ants, both the direct effects on other ant species in invaded habitats, as well as the indirect effects on all kinds of other organisms, sort of as, as, the, in, as the effects of Argentine ant invasions cascade through um, the food web. So things like earthworms and birds and horn lizards, all kinds of things are affected by uh, the invasion of the species. Um, so what are some of the features that uh, allow, our, that appear to be associated with the success of Argentine ants? Um, they are dietary generalists. They can feed on just about anything. So you'll find them uh, tending uh, things like scale insects, aphids, mealybugs for honeydew, as shown in this picture here. They'll um, hunt insects that are small enough for them to capture. They'll um, scavenge. You'll find them going into dumpsters behind a McDonald's, or you'll find them um, you know, living in a fairly pristine habitat like we have around here, foraging on whatever they can find. So they're dietary generalists. They'll eat just about anything. Um, they're adap adapted to disturbed habitats, so um, they're an example of one of these species that even in the native range tends to occur in floodplain areas, and so they um, uh, do well in disturbed habitats, and um, in their introduced range, humans disturb many habitats, which allows them to gain a foothold. Um, they uh, use genetic cues to determine colony membership. This is something that I'll talk about in the end. I think many of you have probably heard me talk about this before, about the role of genetics in the colony structure of Argentine ants and how that plays into their success. And they're highly polygyne, um, which uh, um, I would say uh, is slightly unusual for ants, but not incredibly rare. This means that within an individual colony, there are many, many reproductive queens. So if some random propagule of ants is picked up in a shovel full of dirt or in a plant that's moved, there's a high probability that that's going to be a viable propagule because it's going to contain reproductive individuals that will be introduced to the new habitat. Okay, and so what I'm going to talk about in terms of our research um, are, is going to be mainly these two things. I'm going to talk about um, work that we've done and are doing um, that uh, um, has relevance for the uh, dietary generalism that is displayed by Argentines. And at the end, I'll talk a little bit about colony structure and um, 
and how genetics play into the um, behavior of their social structure. Oh, but before I leave uh, and, and delve uh, solely into Argentine ants, I just want to note that um, uh, these are features that are shared nearly universally across invasive ants. And so taken as a suite of um, traits, they're incredibly rare in ants generally, but they're really the rule for invasive ants. And so these are really, these, this is a sort of rogues gallery of the world's most nasty invasive species, um, Argentine ant here. Um, but um, all of these display the same traits that I just described to you. The polygyne form of the red import fire ant within the southeastern US, the crazy ant, Anaplephus gracilipes, which is the one that's well, most well known for overrunning Christmas Island, where there's the you know, um, really stunning migration of crabs every year. The big-headed ant, Fidoli megacephala, this is the one that Economo and Sarnat looked at as their invasive species in Melanesia. It's widespread throughout the Pacific, probably originates from Africa. The little fire ant, which um, is shown uh, with a pencil for scale to indicate where it got, where its name derives from. Um, this is one that is rapidly spreading um, throughout many parts of the world. It has a neotropical origin. Um, and interestingly, introduced populations um, of this species are asexual, they're clonal. And then the tropical fire ant, another one which is distributed widely throughout the Pacific um, and other parts of the world. Okay, um, and so, uh, um, so, um, the people who study Argentine ants study Argentine ants for a variety of different reasons. Um, the Argentine ant research community contains um, people who are interested in very applied things, such as conservation biology, or people who are interested in very basic things, such as the evolution of social structure, kinship, things like that. Um, starting in about 2009, this diverse group of individuals got together and decided to um, see if we could get uh, the genome of the Argentine ant sequenced. And we were able to, we published it in 2011. Um, and one of the notable things about this is, that I like to say is that um, this group of people sort of resemble Argentine ants themselves because we did this with zero grant support. This genome was sequenced solely through, you know, little pots of discretionary money that people had, a thousand bucks here, two thousand bucks there, and huge amounts of time that all of these individuals devoted to a variety of different um, aspects of sequencing this genome. In fact, it was great to see we would have, um, on occasion, uh, annotation jamborees where everybody would get together after the genome had been sequenced and assembled, and we would have these field biologists who could barely operate a mouse, you know, <laughs> learning how to annotate a genome. And so we'd all be together in the same room, we'd be like, okay, here's the next step. And myself included, we worked our way through it. Um, and so it was, it was great to see that this, uh, this social group came together in such a cooperative way, resembling the organism that we actually study. Um, so what are some things that came out of the genome that are relevant for um, this topic of pre-adaptation of Argentine ants as an invasive species? Um, we thought going into it that, um, that chemosensory biology would be incredibly important because Argentine ants are nesting generalists and, as I said, dietary generalists. Um, and looking at um, one aspect of chemosensory biology, the odorant receptors, which are annotated by Hugh Robertson, um, it's clear that Argentine ants have a huge number of these odorant receptors. These are receptors on their antenna that they go out into the world and smell things with. However, this proliferation of odorant receptors isn't unique to Argentine ants. If you look at four other ants whose genomes have been sequenced, they have many odorant receptors as well. And on average, ants have um, uh, more odorant receptors than you see in your typical insect. And this is probably because, as you social insects, ants are chemically oriented creatures. They use chemical cues and airborne, pher airborne pheromones for regulating all aspects of their daily behavior. However, when we looked at gustatory receptors, these are now taste receptors, also used for detecting chemical cues, but instead of airborne cues, these are um, cues that are either liquid or solid at room temperature. You can see that, you can see the Argentine ants have uh, many more genes uh, of these gustatory receptors than do um, these other species that have uh, that had their odor receptors uh, annotated. And interestingly, if you look at just the gene tree of these odor receptors, if you look in the Argentine ant genome, there's this huge, not odor receptors, gustatory receptors. If you, there's this huge radiation of gustatory receptors in the Argentine ant genome that actually structurally are tandem repeats all right next to each other. You have, you know, like 80 copies of this gene tandemly repeated, bang, 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 right next to each other in the Argentine ant genome. And so we're really in, interested in going into non-invasive, closely related uh, species um, in the genus Linopithema to see if that there, this is a feature, to see how ancestral this feature is. Is this something that's a recent acquisition, a recent occurrence within Argentine ants, or is it something that's more um, ancestral? 
Um, within the Argentine ant genome, there also appear to be many uh, cytochrome P450s, and these are genes that are used for detoxifying various things, including toxins that you might get in your diet. Presumably, this is something that's good for somebody who's a generalist. You're going to be eating lots of different things. You have to be able to deal with lots of different diets that may have a variety of different toxins in them. And so you can see Argentine ants have 111 of these cytochrome P450 genes. Um, they have um, uh, 69 of this uh, CYP, what are called cytochrome P450 clan 3 genes, which is more than any other ant genome or any other insect genome at the time. I haven't kept up with how many are in more recent insect genomes because they just keep coming so fast and furious. Um, but you can see, comparing this to the other ant species, we have here um, two specialists. This is a, a leafcutter ant, and these are harvester ants. So um, leafcutter ants specialize on feeding on fungus that they grow in their gardens. Harvester ants specialize on eating seeds. These are specialists. They have not too many of these cytochrome P450s, whereas Campanotus floridanus is a generalist as well, a dietary generalist. Um, it has many of these cytochrome P450s. And then we have this odd case here. This is one of the more basal ants in ant phylogeny. It has um, a fair number of these cytochrome P450s, but it's not a generalist. It's largely a predatory ant. And so I don't have an explanation for why they have so many. But this sort of generally fits with the pattern we would expect a signature in the genome of this sort of generalist dietary um, uh, lifestyle. I'll just say, um, I should probably wrap it up pretty soon, so I'll just say that, um, you know, one of the things, so the genomic revolution, of course, has brought all kinds of excitement. There are incredible things that we're discovering as we look into the genomes of a variety of different creatures, and we'll hear a lot about, a lot more about this, I'm sure, in the rest of this meeting. Um, but at the same time, I, I would say that um, the more of these studies I look at, including our own genome project, the more I, uh, I see sort of this uh, template of a genome that's sequenced, people see these patterns in the genome, and then they try and infer biological meaning from it, right? And, and, um, and so in many cases, I feel like the conclusions that are drawn from patterns of um, uh, gene abundance, proliferation in gene families within the genome are, are um, sort of ad hoc stories that are really um, generating hypotheses that need to be tested in a functional way in the future, right? I see many of these genome projects as not answering questions, but really posing more questions for the future. And that includes what I just told you about the chemosensory genes and cytochrome P450s. And so moving forward, we're trying to get into a more um, functional genetic context. So we have um, RNA interference now working for Argentine ants, where we can target individual genes and shut down um, the expression of individual genes. And so we're working through um, candidate genes, in this case for pheromone biosynthesis, where we can feed our, our RNAi constructs to Argentine ants. And in this gene, for example, or well, we have variable effects. This is probably the prettiest one. Um, the RNAi treated ants at, uh, I think this is eight, four hours, 24 hours, and 48 hours are shown in black. Controls that are just fed a uh, GFP construct are shown here. The height of the bar is um, gene expression. In most cases, when we target um, a gene with these RNAi constructs, we can shut down expression of just that gene and not other genes. And so I'm hoping that approaches like this will allow us to sort of move beyond correlational genomic studies and move into sort of more functional testing of candidate genes that we believe are involved in important things for invasion biology as well as um, all kinds of other aspects of um, organismal biology. And um, with that, I'd be happy to take a question if there's time.